in this uh, in the Memento cache and most multi-tenanted systems, you know, you can just absorb these spikes because the capacity is already there. You're not waiting for new EC2 instances to show up to be able to handle that that burst. And this is how we offer our customers instant elasticity, automatic scaling, and the lack of maintenance windows because we have the ability to add capacity, remove it, or to deploy without impacting their cache hit rate. Kwasha Shams, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks, Alex. It's a pleasure to be here. Huge fan of yours, so always excited to go talk to you. Thank you, and likewise. So you're one of the co-founders of Memento, and I've been really interested in what's going on in this, this space lately, talking with you, working with you a little bit. But for those of you that haven't heard of Memento, what, what is Memento? Memento is an intelligent serverless cache. Um, a cache helps uh, you access data faster. Um, intelligent means that it lets you do everything that you need to get right without any configurations. You just have to name it, and we take care of the, uh, of the rest. Serverless means that you don't have to worry about the infrastructure behind the scenes. It kind of just happens uh, for you. Awesome. I love that. And I want to I want to dig into that serverless part specifically because we're seeing more and more databases over the past months and years and start to call themselves serverless. And I think there's a huge spectrum on what that means. On I think on on one sense it might mean auto scales sort of slowly for you. And on, on, on the other end, it means maybe closer to true serverless. So I guess what does serverless mean for you and, and especially as applied to Memento? So I'm really passionate about serverless. I think it got coined as a marketing term many months ago or a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, serverless got coined as a, as a marketing term a few years ago, but it's been around since the original cloud services. So SQS, the first, um, you know, one of the first AWS services, one that actually predates S3 is completely serverless. And what that means is that you never have to worry about the number of machines or the types of machines that you have in the background. You never have to worry about replication. You don't have to have capacity that you're managing and it scales down to zero when you're not using it. It doesn't cost you anything at all. And to me, you know, SQS is serverless for queuing. Uh, S3 is serverless for, uh, for storage. And you never have to think about, well, how many gigabytes am I provisioning in my S3 bucket? Think of how painful that would be if you had to provision gigabytes in your S3 bucket. You don't think like that. You just, um, you know, you just do puts and you do gets. And when, you're, when you go do the gets, it's there when you need it. Um, and to me, that's what captures the essence of, of serverless. Awesome. I love that. So, um, you know, if I want to go spin up and uh, y'all are newly, newly public launch here, if I want to go get started with Memento, what does it look like for me to, to sort of provision a cache? How do I pay for it? What does that look like? Yeah. So serverless means that you can access it via a simple API call. So for us, it's literally as simple as create cache and you pass in one parameter, which is the name of the cache. That's it. Behind the scenes, um, all of the, you know, multi-availability zones, uh, you know, the encryption end-to-end, -end, encryption arrest, all of that, the capacity management kind of gets blended and abstracted away to, a, to an actual uh, layer of abstraction. The pricing model is also completely serverless, which means that it scales down to zero. When you're not using it, you don't owe it anything. Um, and in fact, your first 50 gigabytes are, are, are free anyway. But uh, the rest of it, the way it works is it's on data transfer in and out. You just pay 15 cents per gig in, 15 cents per gig out. It's one dimension, one price, um, and everything else is just kind of taken care of on your behalf. That's awesome. So I know a lot of people have probably used caches like Redis, Memcache, things like that. Um, what what was it that led you to sort of build this new cache? Was it mostly operational around serverless or is it, is it something else? Like, wh why did you get interested in building a, a new cache? Yeah, so Daniela and I worked together on DynamoDB. We, we used to go to AWS operational uh, metrics review. It's a two hour meeting um, every Wednesday. And we saw repeatedly people were having, even inside of AWS, um, same patterns of outages around caches. And then we started, you know, we went, we left, we started working with AWS customers and we saw some of the same patterns over and over and over again through misconfigurations, lack of capacity, too much capacity, hot shards, all the same things that everybody kind of learns and about one, learns about it by like experiencing an outage that could have been avoided. And, and then they do the exact same solution over and over and over again. And we realized that we can actually just automate the, the same things that everybody does with one and, and just skip to the good part. Like don't have to go through outages to learn what a hard chart is, what a hot key is, 
um, what it means to be under provision, what it means to be over provision and so forth, and just deliver it to the, uh, to the end users. The other part of it that we learned was that it just took too long to, to build a cache. And when we built services inside of AWS, we realized that it took us, you know, the amount of time to integrate a cache was measured in sprints. Sure, it takes a few minutes to provision it on, a, um, on the console, but just to get the configurations right, just to instrument the cache, to benchmark it, to make sure it can handle the capacity that you need, um, and, and then, you know, deploy it for staging, for development, for, um, and for, uh, you know, your production environments. It just, it was way too much work. And we realized that none of that work needs to exist. We don't measure the time it takes to create a DynamoDB table um, in sprints. It's literally, you create the table and you kind of just assume it's there and that it can handle the capacity that you need it to. And that was kind of what we were trying to pursue. We wanted to build that same experience, but for caching. I love that. I, I, you know, I've been doing serverless stuff for a while now, and there's just such a huge difference between the services in your application that are serverless and you sort of can assume on and rely on a little bit and those that aren't. And now you have to do all this capacity planning, testing and, and operational um, just worry around it. And it, it, it's pretty fun to see this this coming into the, the caching space as well. Um, what's it look like, you know, as a company, you know, early adoption and things like that? Can you talk about customers or user interesting use cases you're seeing or, or anything like that? Yeah, we, we're seeing a few interesting things. So one trend is that because um, the non-serverless world requires you to provision capacity, we notice that almost everybody that we work with ends up over-provisioning their caches by up to 10x. Because what they're doing is they're provisioning for their peak load, even though that might be a few minutes uh, of the day, they still have to provision for it because auto-scaling with caching just doesn't work like that. Um, and as a result, there's a whole lot of wastage. And for customers, it's always exciting to be able to show up and say, oh, yeah, you're, you know, we can drop your bill by like 90% <laughs> because you don't have to provision capacity. Provisioning is bad. Anytime you have provision units, it's just, you know, it's not efficient. So, so that's been exciting. In terms of customers, like, I love talking about Wise Labs, one of my favorite companies. They make smart devices, and the company has a very noble charter. They want to make smart devices as easy to use and as economical as regular devices. So one of their devices is a smart camera. And it's pretty economical, really easy to use. And when that smart camera detects a human or a package or one of the many things that it can do with its AI at the edge uh, detection, whenever it detects it, it takes a thumbnail and it stores that thumbnail into Memento. And that sticks there for about 14 days. And, you know, we, we deliver it to their customers, um, you know, almost instantaneously when it is requested. This particular workflow, I mean, it took them a few weeks to integrate, bring it to production, and it's going to save them or, you know, it's already saving them on the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Um, and then we have customers like Paramount that are, you know, uh, it's a parent company for CBS, uh, for Showtime, Pluto TV, and so forth. There's Max Preps. There's a whole lot of companies there. And we have been working with the Paramount teams across the board on improving their performance. Uh, in some cases, they improved their performance by 15%. Um, in some cases, they were really excited about the fact that they no longer had maintenance windows because serverless doesn't have maintenance windows. Um, so they improved their availability and they improved their ability to handle hot shards and hot keys, which was a big source of outages for them um, over the last year. Awesome. Awesome. And I'm sure just like with caching or, or hosted databases, you're just you're just dealing with such high scale use cases, right? The whole reason people are using a cache is because they have just so many requests or so many and you get hot keys, hot shards. Just uh, I'm, I'm sure you're going to see uh, just amazing, amazing workloads there. Um, I want to move into a little bit on just like technical background and get into um, how Memento is actually built. Like, what are the technical challenges involved in in making something serverless and especially something stateful, you know, like a cache serverless? Yeah, there's a there's a few things uh, that you have to do. One of the core benefits of Memento or one of the internal technical details is that it is a multi-tenanted cache. So what this allows us to do is to share the capacity that's, you know, idle capacity that's being unused by a lot of the customers and then make it available because then any customers spike, they just a drop in the, in the bucket. 
And doing that right requires a fair amount of rigor to protect the customers from noisy neighbors, to, um, to do the right routing, and to do the capacity management to make sure that we have sufficient capacity when a customer shows up. And, and you see this working in, um, in a lot of production systems out there. So DynamoDB, S3, SQS, Kinesis, these are all multi-tenanted systems. And, um, and multi-tenancy actually, it's counterintuitive, but multi-tenancy actually improves your availability, improves your security, and actually improves your performance. Because like, I'll give you one quick example. Um, consider when you, like, let's say you have an elastic cash cluster and you have some auto scaling provision. By the time your load spike and you detect it, and then you issue a command to add more capacity, and then you have to tell all of your clients that the new capacity is there, and then you have to wait for all of the churn, all the data to get relocated to the right new number of nodes. That whole, you know, legacy, that whole saga is measured in tens of minutes. And your spike may just come in and, and, and go during that time. Whereas in this, uh, in the Memento cache and most multi-tenanted systems, you know, you can just absorb these spikes because the capacity is already there. You're not waiting for new EC2 instances to show up to be able to handle that, that burst. And this is how we offer our customers instant elasticity, automatic scaling, and the lack of maintenance windows because we have the ability to add capacity, remove it, or to deploy without impacting their cash hit rates. I love it. And um, I guess, are there any trade-offs or downsides to the system? Because when I hear you say all that stuff, I'm just like, oh, that makes so much more sense about sort of smoothing some of that, that uh, you know, the spikes out across customers being able to scale up more quickly. I guess, what are the trade-offs or, or downsides or anything like that? Um, the downsides are in, when you're at smaller scale. Um, so in some of our regions where we don't have a lot of customers using us, um, we're not as efficient, right? So because we have to have capacity to be able to handle the, you know, any burst from, from any of the customers. So when you're small and, and you haven't scaled yet, there's a little bit more excess. Um, but over time, as more and more customers kind of show up, you your overall fleet utilization just goes through the roof. And then now you're you're actually enabling the customers to get the same benefits without wasting a lot of resources yourself. Now it's... Um, you know, so at smaller scale, it's it's a little bit harder, but um, but it's still more efficient. Like I said, when when we see customers, you know, it's so frequent we see customers with, you know, a ten TPS workload that they have, you know, three nodes sitting there handling. So compared to that, our utilization actually doesn't look that bad, and even in the smaller regions. But I'm really excited about as our regions start to scale up, they just become way more efficient. Yep, absolutely, and it's it's cool just the sort of operational leverage you can get from one team managing this multi-tenant system and not treating them as individual ones, but, you know, treating it more as a system as a whole. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, I want to go into like specific challenges around caches in particular. You mentioned hot shards, hot keys. Can you talk about any of those and maybe how you had to solve those um, at, a, at a caching level? Yeah, the, the pain with caching is quite elastic. <laughs> Um, you know, it, it comes down to if you're provisioning a single node, it's actually quite easy because then there isn't a lot of configurations. There's that one node and you just go to it and you know, it's going to have the data you're, you're done. As soon as you start to add a replica, now you have to know who's the primary, who's the secondary. And, and you have to be very clinical about it because if you send your rights to the, to the replica, it's not going to work. <laughs> Um, so now you've got all this leaky state that's, you know, the state that's leaked out to your, your clients. And by the way, your clients have to agree on, on this state as well, especially when you, so again, one note, easy replication makes it a little tougher. And then you get into this notion of, well, what if I have sharding? So now I've got, you know, three nodes with three additional replicas around it. Now, each of your clients have to agree on how the data is distributed amongst these nodes. And, and when you are trying to scale up, you know, you want to go from three nodes with three replicas to six nodes with six replicas. Now all the clients have to also agree that now there are six and this is how the key space is divided. So things get even more hairy. And then when now you're running in this six node cluster uh, plus six replicas, so 12 nodes total, and everything is fine under the assumption that each node has a uniform load. And that's just not how life works. 
oftentimes you'll get one customer that is really popular or you're a store and you get that one item that just dropped and everybody wants it. Now you've got a hot key or a group of keys that are hot and one of your six shards is taking a disproportionate amount of load. And the only antidote you have to that is, well, you scale up the whole thing. So now instead of just doubling the capacity on that one node, you actually have to multiply your capacity by six because you have six nodes. Each one of them has to be able to deal with the peak load of any given shard. So it just becomes like the more you grow, the more painful caching becomes today. And our goal is to make caching as simple as that one box, right? We want to take this, you know, in your architectural diagram, the 15 boxes you might have on how the replication is done, who's the primary, who's the secondary, and just replace that with one single box that is Memento. And all of these details we kind of handle uh, behind the scenes for you. Awesome. I don't know how much you can get into like technical details underlying there, but mm -hmm. you know, you're talking multi-tenant. I assume you have sort of multiple caches from different customers on the same storage nodes there. How do you protect mm -hmm. one from another if you have this, this huge spike in traffic? Yeah, we take a lot of um, um, inspiration from how Facebook and Twitter do caching. So Facebook has um, this capability called McRouter. McRouter is a, you know, it's a great piece of software. It's a proxy layer. And the proxy can do a lot of interesting things like warming the cache when new nodes are coming in or when nodes are going out, you know, warming it off, cooling it off. All of that gets handled at the proxy layer. Twitter does something similar with, with Trem Proxy. And for in our case, the proxy does a lot of the sharding, the routing, and so forth, but it also does authentication. So in Memento, every single request is authenticated and authorized. And at that point, the proxy ensures that only the data that belongs to this particular customer is going back to them. And in fact, this actually makes things more, uh, more secure compared to what most customers are doing, which is they open up an Elastic Cache or a Redis cluster. It doesn't have authentication. It's just open to anybody on the VPC, right? So by having these actual JWT tokens with claims embedded in them, we actually enforce that only the services that have the right tokens with the right authorization are able to access the data that you have anointed them to do so. Yep, awesome. And then, you know, that's protecting them from sort of a security access level thing. How do you protect them performance wise? Like if, if my data is sort of on the same note as your data, what do you, and all of a sudden I'm getting a ton of requests, how do we make sure that, that you know, your performance isn't affected? Yeah, so there's another piece of the system which we call the, the cache admin. And what cache admin is doing is, it's a few things. One of them is it makes sure that the fleet is healthy. So it's monitoring every single one of the proxy nodes, every single one of the cache nodes and so forth. Um, and then the other thing that it does is it makes sure that um, we have enough capacity across the fleet. So it's looking at fleet-wide metrics and making sure that we can provision the right number of nodes. And remember, the fleet isn't going to react as erratically as like a single customer would. So we have like law of large numbers playing, and that gives us a little bit more time to proactively provision more capacity and to proactively go issue the um, you know EC2 start instance API calls and start adding capacity. And the third thing that it does is it ensures that um, each cache has got a, uh, a sufficient amount of capacity. So each cache is actually limited in how much capacity it can take on, but the cache admin is paying attention. It's looking at the loads over time and it just keeps adding more capacity to the, to the customer that, that need it the most. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, I know you've got a, a deep background at AWS, including on the you know DynamoDB team, and and you know I love Dynamo, of course. Um, <laughs> there's the new DynamoDB paper that came out this year in, in 2022, and I, I just see like a lot of you know similarities, at least in, in in terms of how that like top level is structured with with sort of partitioning and routing uh, among that, and, and and the different work it's doing to to scale up capacity. It's it's pretty cool for people that that want more background on that. Um, did you have any like I guess unique challenges for caching type workloads as opposed to databases, you know, caching so much more about per persistence, maybe a little more ephemeral, but then as compared to databases, any, any unique challenges there? Yeah, I'm always humbled by the 
hard problems that the DynamoDB team is solving. And it just gets harder every day because, you know, it's it's not just our favorite service. It's like a lot of people love it and they keep throwing more load at it. It's, it's a, So the problem just gets harder every single day. And But aside from that, durability is a really hard problem. I would actually say DynamoDB is the most durable service in AWS today because not only are you storing your data on multiple SSDs every time you, you get a 200 from DynamoDB, it's actually also getting backed up to S3. So by definition, it's like a superset of Dynamo plus S3. It's a point of pride for us that Dynamo is more durable than S3 because it uses S3 um, as a backup. But you know, durability is hard, transactionality is hard. Whereas caching actually has, you know, those dimensions are actually not as critical in a cache. What is critical in a cache is tail latencies. We have to be able to return data as quickly as possible. And, and we have to be able to deal with a node, a cache node that is slow because maybe EC2 is bad or maybe that node is overloaded and, and whatnot. And we do some interesting tricks to make that happen. So first of all, on our proxy node, a proxy is stateless, so we can actually add a lot of them, and um, um, and that actually works to our to our benefit. But one of the other things that that the proxy does is all your data is replicated to multiple nodes in Memento. When you when a proxy receives a GET request, it actually issues two GETs and returns the first one that comes back, and this allows you to actually. Um, uh, deal with a, a slow node, for for instance, or a bad network weather pattern. So because we're optimizing tail latencies, we do this best of two lookup. And, and because we're not doing the, you know, durability and transactionality that Dynamo needs to support, things become easier for us as well. Yep. Awesome. Cool. Um, so, you know, again, you've been at AWS and you've seen some of the scale there. What, what sort of operational or engineering practices have you taken from AWS and, and brought to Memento? Yeah, um, one of the things that we tried to do from the very first day uh, for Danielle and me was to make sure that we, you know, we we still cling on to the operational rigor that comes from Amazon. And, um, you know, it's really easy for startup to be just in growth mode and just like build, build, build. But what we have learned and what we've seen too many times is operational excellence is really hard to kind of jerry rig in the middle of a successful business. So some practices that we do, um, each week there's a, um, uh, a metrics review. And even if there's an uneventful week, there's no uneventful weeks. Like there's always some interesting weather patterns. There's some false alarms that happen. There's some operational issues that, that happen. So every week um, on Mondays, we meet for an operational metrics meeting where the on-call presents the, you know, the, uh, the, the dashboard goes over the metrics, goes over the anomalies, and explains what actually happened. Um, then there's the COE process, the correction of error process that Amazon has. Whenever there is something that was a breach in process where a customer could have been impacted or took undue risk for the customers, we write about it. And we the most important parts there are, here's the actions, here's the owners, here's the dates. So this action-driven correction of error process we brought on from Amazon. So dashboarding, metrics reviews, COEs, um, and then just broader instrumentation in the service. These are all feedback mechanisms. They kind of just make each other uh, stronger by having each one of them there. Yeah. Can you share like what are the what are the metrics you you look at most closely or care about most closely? Yeah, we. One of the things that differentiates us from other caching providers is we actually pay a lot of attention to cash hit rates for our customers. Um, it is too easy as a caching provider to say, you know, cash hit rate, that's the customer's problem. If they didn't give me the data, why is it, you know, how can I be upheld for, uh, held accountable for it? But we, we take a slightly different perspective of it. We know that if we bounced a node, for instance, that might impact customers' cash hit rates. And so we, we pay attention to that, and we have canaries that are, are monitoring their own cash at rates as well. So we're paying attention to fleet-wide cash at rates. We're paying attention to our canaries' um, cash at rates. The other ones are latencies. Like we pay attention to 99.9 .9 percentile latency, and that's always, you know, all our graphs inside, they are all 99.9 .9 percentile um, latency for, for performance. Um, and then it's just, you know, in general, it's just, it's just the performance, it's cash at rates, it's, um, and it's just the fleet-wide utilization. We are, you know, we're trying to be judicious with our own spend 
as well. So we pay attention to how much over-provisioning we have in place, because if we can make our infrastructure more efficient, then we can reduce the cost for our customers as well. Yeah. You mentioned tail latency a few times. I think that's such an interesting one. Uh, can you talk about like, I don't know if you have targets for that or senses, but it's in, and maybe I don't want to get in the comparison game too much with, with other caches, but like what, how, do, how does Momento improve on that? What, what should people expect? Yeah, tail, tail latencies are, are, are really important to pay attention to because as applications become more interactive, most requests are actually going to the database or the cache multiple times. And, you know, P999 is like the new P90 because, you know, every single time, like we, we have a, a really simple social network example that LRE has done on our website, where if you want to fetch the images of, let's say your, your social network, you have a user with 50 friends and you just want to fetch the names of their 50 friends, that's going to be 50 lookups, right? And if you paginate it with 10 names at a time, that's still 10 lookups in the critical path of a request. So it really becomes important for the tail latency to, to, be, um, to be predictable, right? And, and oftentimes when people don't pay attention, what they don't realize is there's often an exponential jump between P99 and P39s. And it's really easy to hide behind that if you're not plotting it and, and paying attention to it. And, and the other part of it is that this has to be measured at the client side. So... You know, we want to measure P39 latency at the client size that's inclusive of any EC2 network overhead. It's inclusive of any cross AZ transfers. And, you know, we, we typically target between two to three milliseconds at 99.9 .9 percentile. And that's, again, that's not as sexy as sub millisecond, but, you know, you have to pay attention to when somebody's selling you sub millisecond, are they talking about tail latencies? Are they talking about average? And are they talking about being able to maintain this consistently regardless of what you throw at it, regardless of the utilization of your system. Because we see people, you know, oftentimes when you have completely underutilized system, as the utilization goes up, your tail latency just exponentially explodes as well. So this is something that we really pay attention to and try to maintain for our customers. Yeah, that's one of the points I hear from Amazon AWS folks the most is like, hey, tail latency is way more important than the median. Don't be thinking like median's nice, but but look at those tails. And like you're saying, if you're fetching 50 friends on every request, you're going to hit in that that three nines, you know, every 20 requests or whatever. So it's just uh, it, it's pretty common that you'll be hitting those and, and, and your users are going to to notice it. Um, so that's great. What, what you, what you learned and brought from AWS, I want to ask the flip side as well. Mm -hmm. Like what are you able to do as a startup? That's maybe different from, from AWS, maybe because of your size or newness or, or whatever like that. Yeah. I mean, it's starting from a clean sheet of paper is always nice. Right. And it's really fun to be able to have this unhindered ability to just innovate. Um, and we've been able to take our product, not just, and just deploy it, not just in AWS, but also deploy it to other cloud providers. So we're already in GCP running in production. And it's always fun to kind of compare and contrast what the, what the multiple cloud providers are doing, what the benefits of each one are, what they, what's, what's gap in, in each one of them. And we have literally just been able to work backwards from our customers and, and just meet them where they're at. It doesn't matter what cloud provider or what region they're in. We can just kind of go in and, and make our services available to them. And that's been um, really exciting for us. Awesome. I know uh, one thing just in the caching world generally that you, you've done a lot of work with, with Twitter type mm -hmm. people and people that are, like mm -hmm. you're saying, pushing the bounds of, of caching. I know one thing is, is around seg cache. Can you maybe talk about seg cache, what it is, how it fits into Memento? Yeah, so seg cache is part of the Pelican project at, uh, at Twitter. It's, um, it's a caching engine that is, hyper optimized for um, TTLs. So we noticed that oftentimes um, customers have TTLs in a cache and the database uh, ends up doing this brute force job of making sure database or cache to making sure that the right uh, items are evicted promptly so that you can free up the space. Now, while that job is running, by the way, your tail latencies get impacted just to you know, pop the stack a little bit, right? Like it just creates variability. Right. And what Secash does is it says, okay, well, I'm going to structure the data on, on in memory or on disk along with how what the TTLs are. And especially if you have lots of small items, they end up being in one big segment um, that has all of the items with similar TTLs. 
And and what that means is that when the right time comes, it's block it's dropping a megabyte all in one chunk rather than dropping individual keys. And dropping individual keys also has this other problem around fragmentation because now you've got like memory space. And and by the way, if you've got this fragmentation, you've got to do a bunch of mem copies and oh boy, like now you're back to tail latencies being impacted again, right? So Secash works really, really well with tail latencies by making some of this upfront allocation of how memory is um, divided um, and being a little bit more organized allows it to really maintain four nines uh, tail very, very smoothly along the way for, for the customers. Um, awesome, and we've been fortunate enough to work closely with the with the Twitter team. It speaks uh, the Memcache protocol as well. So if you have Memcache, you can just go download Pelican, set cache. Um, it's rewritten in Rust, and you can just use it today as a um, as a drop in replacement as well. Yeah, really cool. And if people want to go further down that rabbit hole, there's a there's a seg cache paper as well. It's really interesting. And just look up the Pelican pod project. That's Pelican with a K, I believe. And if you just yep. find that, you can just some of the work they're doing at Twitter around caching. You know, they're posted, they're doing some pretty high scale workloads there. So it's a really interesting cutting edge stuff there. Um, I want to talk, you know, a little bit about your personal background because I think this is this is really <laughs> interesting as well. Like you, you started at NASA and was, were doing amazing things with NASA. So started in space and then I guess brought it down a little bit to the cloud when you went to <laughs> AWS and, and and now you're at Memento. But t tell us about that path and, and your background. What were you doing at NASA? Yeah, I started working on cameras on board the Mars rovers. I I was pursuing a degree in electrical engineering and computer science uh, combined. And then I realized that I'm not smart enough to be an electrical engineer. Um, so I, I, I went down, like I, I was just, and, and like jokes aside, I was really passionate about software. The, the instant gratification of software really appealed to me. So I moved my major to computer science and I went up the stack on the, um, on the camera side to just processing images. And we were processing multi-gigapixel panoramas in real time. As soon as the data came down from Mars, we had to process this five gigapixel image, combine all the images put together and deliver them to the scientists around the globe. And it became really painful to wait for the capacity that we had on premise. So we became one of the earliest customers for AWS. My lab just moved all the Mars data processing onto AWS in production. This is in the early, like mid 2000s, right? Like pre 2010. Um, there weren't a lot of services, but, you know, you could do a lot with EC2, SQS, and S3, yeah. right? And, and so that was fascinating. And I, you know, after the rover landed, I, I thought, well, um, so this is the Curiosity rover landed in 2012. Um, I got asked to come join AWS, and I found the mission at AWS to be pretty inspirational. They were making developers more productive. And when developers are more productive more innovation happens, more experimentation happens, more risk-taking happens. And that has such a profound influence on society. So that's the calling I had to join AWS, and that's the same calling that I carried with me to build more serverless capabilities for, for everybody um, and to just help save developers time and let them be more productive. Yeah, and, and I saw when you came to AWS, you were a TA for Charlie Bell. Did, did you start that right when you came to AWS, you were a TA for him? Yeah, traditionally the TA role is reserved for people who live and breathe the Amazon culture for like a decade or something, right? And I got lucky; they they were able to make an exception, and and I was able to to be a TA. Um, it was one of the most inspirational, you know, seventeen months or fourteen months that I had to just kind of learn and absorb the Amazon culture. Um, there's so much maybe, to learn there. Maybe for people that don't know, maybe give a little background on who Charlie is and what that TA role is, because I think it's uh, you know so, some interest, some great people have gone through that and and just I imagine seen some really cool things. Yeah, so TA stands for technical assistant. So you are um, and Charlie ran basically uh, product engineering for AWS at the time, and um, you know the three the trio at AWS at the time was Andy, Adam, and Charlie, and and they worked very very closely together to make AWS a reality, that vision uh, into a, a reality. And a TA, a technical assistant is basically that. It's an assistant who happens to be technical and, um, and carries, becomes basically an extension of the executive that they are supporting. So they go to the, all the same meetings that the executive is going to. 
they operate with the same authority that the executive has. And you're basically just trying to augment bandwidth. And in the process, what you're doing is you're absorbing what it takes to become a great leader and how to operate at, you know, 20 levels above where you are today, right? By, by just watching uh, some of the great leaders in action. Um, and so that's, that was my job. I, I got to do a lot of fun things, meeting, like doing executive sponsorship for some key customers, um, helping launch Kinesis, writing some code alongside some of my favorite people at Amazon to, to make the Kinesis launch a success, and then subsequently landing myself in, um, into running DynamoDB. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, for people that don't know, like Kwaja is uh, just a really great background. Doing that TA, head of engineering uh, at Dynamo, and then was, was a VP at, at AWS Elemental for a while. And, and your co-founder, Janela, she's uh, quite accomplished as well, you know, helped helped launch some great stuff at Dynamo and then was early at LightStep and, and, and just really cool stuff there. I guess we talked a little bit technically about what's different from going from AWS to a small startup. What about just people wise or organizational wise? What have you, has anything been hard for you or what, what do you um, think about that transition? Yeah, it's, it's been a joy, right? To be honest, our, our team, Danielle and I are really focused on, on the people. Memento is about the people and, um, and we, we try hard not to lose touch of the fact that our customers are people, our team is people, our investors are people. And, and that has to be, you know, front and center for us. Um, we're, we're definitely executing, right? We're, we're built, we built a great product, but just that level of emphasis that we have from people, um, I'm really proud of. And I learned a lot of that at AWS Elemental, where it was a really good mix, where we were able to find the Amazon AWS style execution while having that center and that focus on, on the people in the, in the company and the people at the, on the customer side. Um, we've also had a big focus on diversity in the company um, and we, you know, and, and every dimension, right? Not, or not every dimension we've been successful at, but we've certainly had a focus on, on, on every dimension. But like, even like some of the, um, the ones that people think about less often in terms of just making sure that we have people who have different backgrounds than us. Um, we have multiple people at, uh, at uh, Momento that don't have a computer science background, right? Um, and, or, or some that were pursuing computer science as their second degree, right? Um, so, so that's been interesting. We have people who are not from Amazon. So as much as like it was easy and convenient for us to just hire like people from our own networks, we've made, we've gone out of our way to find people who are coming from the customers or from, from other cloud providers to make sure that we are building a well-balanced team. Um, so that's been really exciting. And the level of passion that we have in the team and, and for each other and the customers, it's, it's extremely energizing. Yeah. Cool. Well, I, I can, uh, you know, some people that that's cheap talk about the people, but I, you know, I've talked with you a number of times over the past few months. I can absolutely vouch for me, vouch for you and, and, and to now just like the way you care about people. And it, it's, it's really been great to see, um, you know, I want to just close it off. Like what's next, what are you excited about? Like, what do you see on the roadmap for Memento? So we just launched our GA um, last week. So we're uh, we're in GA and the floodgates are open. Um, we we have our heads down, just building features, some uh, additional capabilities like data structures, and then you know supporting more regions, supporting um, you know other capabilities for our customers as they come in. So our our focus for the next few months is to take the existing pipeline to production, to make more customers um, happy with. Um, with the way uh, they consume caches today, um, and to just deliver the operational excellence, because we we internalize that caches are mission critical. So we're we're just focused on making sure that our customers have the best um, uptime that they possibly can with uh, Momento. That's great. Uh, Quadra, it's been great having you on today, and um, I want you to tell not only where can people find more about Memento, but where can people find you? Because I know you've been sharing a lot of knowledge on Twitter lately about what you've learned over the over the years. Where can where can they find Memento and you? Yeah, GoMomento.com. Um, you know, our our goal is to have people be able to use Memento in like five minutes. So let me know if that doesn't work for you. Um, I'll buy you a coffee if it doesn't work for you because um, it's you know metrics are important. Um, and then uh, you can follow me on Twitter, KSSHAMS. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I try to, I, I've been trying to become more active on, on sharing some of the lessons that we're learning as just part of a community service. It's not just 
you know, here's why you use Momento, but just general distributed systems lessons. And it's actually been quite helpful, Alex, to get guidance from you and, and, and people like Alan on how to share and how to, uh, how to be most useful to the community as well. So I really appreciate the, the mentorship there. Awesome. Likewise. Well, Kwaja, thanks for coming on and talking about Memento today. Thank you.